Well, friends, once again, welcome back. My name is Meshach Canyon, I'm a pastor of Friendship United Methodist Church, and I'll be bringing you a message from Daniel chapter 3, verses 8 through 23. Uh, if you'd like to watch the previous sermon in this series that we have going on, you can click the link on the screen if you're viewing it from a mobile device. I've also uh, added the link in the description section right underneath this video. So you can do that now or after the video if, if you'd like to uh, see how this sermon connects with the previous sermon. Uh, but anyways, today's message is on a subject that the Bible has a lot to say about. One might say it's the crucial component in a relationship with God. Now, of course, I'm referring to the subject of faith. Faith is so important to life with God that the writer of Hebrews even says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if faith is that important to life with God, it's vital that we come to know uh, what it is so that we can not only have it, but we can have an abundance of it and really please God. And stories like the one we're going to consider today do an excellent job of teaching on the nature of faith. So let me just summarize what's happening in this passage for you real quick. King Nebuchadnezzar uh, had a 90-foot statue uh, built and commanded that everyone bow down and worship it whenever they hear certain music being played. Now, some of the Chaldeans, uh, who happened to be jealous of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's success, they saw that they weren't bowing down to worship the statue when the music was being played, and so they went and told on them to King Nebuchadnezzar, who then ordered that they be brought before him. And as they're standing before him, Nebuchadnezzar gives them one last chance uh, to worship the statue. Um, and if they didn't worship the statue, they'd be thrown into the fiery furnace. Okay, so what does this have to teach us about faith? Well, first of all, it shows us what faith is. Now, this seems like a bit of a no-brainer. A lot of people assume that they know what faith is. But what they're usually referring to is something more along the lines of a statement of faith. Well, and not actual faith, but something that you can ramble off. There's several books in the Bible that have a lot to say about faith, but in James, it, it touches the issue in a specific manner because the church in his day was wrestling with the idea of saving faith. Namely, is it rooted in works? Is it mere belief or mental assent? And this is an argument that was also at the center of the Reformation. So to the people who are believing that faith is something that's purely mental, he writes this, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So what's he saying? Well, he's saying that a real faith, real belief in God is revealed in action. So even the demons believe, and as we saw throughout the Gospels, they tremble whenever Jesus, God in the flesh, would come around. So in a weird way, we even learn from the demons what faith and belief look like. It's something that has action to it. On the flip side, mere statements of faith that lack a corresponding action prove to be a dead faith, which, which is useless. And we actually see a, a good illustration of this in the previous chapter of Daniel. You might recall that after Daniel revealed the dream and interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible says that this is how Nebuchadnezzar responded. He said, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. So we might hear that and conclude, wow, Nebuchadnezzar has come to faith in God. But clearly the story reveals that he was just making a cold statement. He had a dead faith. And how do we know that he had a dead faith? Well, because there is no action taken in light of his discovery, in light of his belief, in light of his statement. Indeed, the action that he took in the very next chapter, the one we're currently studying, reveals that rather than having faith in God, that God is the Lord of Kings, he actually believes that Nebuchadnezzar is still the Lord of Kings. And how do we know this? Because of what he did. He began erecting a statue so that people can praise and worship that statue rather than the living God. So it's his actions that reveal to us what his faith is in. Now here's something to think about. If you want to see what you have faith in, don't look at the creeds that you profess or the answers that you might give but take into account the things that you do. Then you'll see where your confidence truly lies. Then you'll see what your faith is rooted in. Now, if we were to apply that same test to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we would discover that their confidence, their faith, was rooted in God. Because from their beliefs about God flowed certain actions. Because they believed that God is the only one worthy of worship, 
they acted accordingly. This means that when everyone else was bowing down to pay homage to this statue because of fear of Nebuchadnezzar and the threat of fire, these three remained standing because of their faith, because of their beliefs in the kind of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob truly was. So faith and action are interconnected. That's the first point. The next thing we learn from this story is the purpose of faith. Now, a lot of people rightly see that faith can be a powerful thing. Just look at some of the things that Jesus and his, his friends have done throughout the ages as they've acted in faith upon God. The sick have been healed. Uh, blind eyes have been opened. Billions of people have come to saving faith in, in Christ. The dead have been raised to new life. All this happened because of a faith in God. So through them, we learn that faith can be a really powerful thing. But it doesn't tell us the purpose of faith just by looking at their actions. And many people begin thinking of faith like the force from Star Wars, as if it's something that we can manipulate once we've learned how to utilize it. In fact, uh, there's a story in the book of Acts about a man named Simon the Great or Simon Magus. And as the story goes, when he saw Peter and John uh, coming and laying hands on people and giving them the Holy Spirit, he said to them, give me this power also so that I can lay hands on people and give them the Spirit. And Peter rebuked him sharply for thinking that he could purchase and manipulate that which was bestowed by faith. So faith isn't something that we can manipulate, but it has a purpose. And once we understand that purpose, we'll understand how we can grow in faith. This passage shows us over and over and over again that the purpose of faith is to prove and to demonstrate the glory and the reliability of God. God gives us the gift of faith and as we learn to appropriate it and use it, we help other people see that our God is trustworthy. That's the purpose of faith. You see, when these three friends refused to worship the statue, they were acting in faith. Their actions communicated something about God to everyone who was watching and listening. Namely, only God is worthy of our worship. Indeed, they said, they said as much when Nebuchadnezzar questioned them and they finally gave him a response. Listen to this exchange that happened between them. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, meaning if you, if you really plan on throwing us into the furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. See, their conversation isn't about them. It's about God, isn't it? We like to read these stories and make much about the people, and praise God for their witness because it's encouraging to us. But we must come to see that the people of great faith are always intent on making much about God, not about themselves. That's why they go on to say, but if not, if God chooses not to deliver us, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So if we look at what they're saying, it reveals a faith that's acting on a knowledge of the goodness and worthiness of God. Indeed, that's what's shocking about their statement. They're telling Nebuchadnezzar, our God is so worthy that even if he doesn't deliver us, we still will never bow down and worship anyone other than him. So in the last analysis, as one commentator wrote, these friends' faith was not in their deliverance, but in their God. They knew that should God deliver them, his name would be vindicated. They also knew that should they die, their faithful testimony would display the worthiness of their God and the unworthiness of Nebuchadnezzar's self-created idol. So death would work in them, but life would surely spring forth in others through their witness and the name of God would be glorified. You see, that's the purpose of faith. We see it in the story. It's the glory of God. So put that into consideration when you're trying to walk by faith. Is your main objective your own deliverance, your own healing, your well-being, or is it that God would be glorified? Because if it's that God would be glorified, then like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and countless children of God who have suffered for his name's sake, you may even begin to see occasions of suffering as opportunities to stand faithful and let your, your faithful actions bespeak the greatness of God. Okay, there's one more thing this passage teaches us about faith. That is this, faith will get you into trouble, especially faith in God. 
When Nebuchadnezzar heard Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say that they wouldn't worship his image, even if their God didn't deliver them, the Bible said he was filled with fury and the expression on his face was changed against them. Then he ordered the, the furnace to be, to be heated seven times more than it usually was, and he had them tied and bound and thrown into the fire. Their faith got them into trouble. Now, you know, we'd like to think that faithful living will always lead to our immediate deliverance. We'd like to think that if we have faith, God will always show up for us. But the fact of the matter is, that's not the common experience. In my days as a pastor, I've experienced this over and over and over again. Someone will live by faith and they'll pray for something, maybe a job or maybe to save a marriage, and the results don't go along with what they've been praying for. In fact, instead of getting a job, perhaps they lose a job. Or instead of saving a marriage, perhaps they get divorced. And because the results weren't what they were anticipating, they lose their faith and they begin to think differently about God. Now, of course, I empathize and sympathize with these people. But the fact of the matter is their expectations or their understanding of the purpose of faith was a little bit off. That's why when they didn't get what they wanted, they began to doubt their belief in God and they began to doubt the goodness of God. But if the Bible teaches us anything, it teaches us that those with great faith often suffer tremendously because of their faith. Think, for example, of Sarah and Abraham, whom God promised to give a son, and they didn't enter into the experience of that promise until 15 years later. Now, if you've ever struggled having children filled with the hope of having a child, 15 years, that's agony. That's 15 years of misery until you finally think, it's too late. It's not going to happen. We're too old. Or as Sarah thought, my body is beyond the point of giving birth. Until then, God finally showed up when this seemed to be beyond the point of possibility. And it's the same for the Israelites. God brought them out of Egypt with a promise of a good land. But early on, they were trapped in the wilderness with the Egyptians bearing down on them, ready to kill them. And they're trapped between the Red Sea and this approaching army. So God rewarded their faith with the threat of imminent death until he delivered them at the very last moment. And as we'll see in this story, God allows Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be bound and to be placed in the most impossible of situations, bound by rope, thrown into a furnace that's so hot that it kills the guards who are responsible for throwing them in. And it's only then when death is a certainty when deliverance seems to be out of the picture, that God finally shows up and delivers them. But I also think it's important to remember that faith is about God's glory, as I said earlier. So if God chooses to be glorified through your death or your suffering, then still count on him to be with you in the midst of it. Because there's one thing that's certain, the person who lives by faith will definitely experience God's deliverance. Sometimes it'll be in this life, Sometimes it'll be the experience of entering our reward in the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. I mean, just look at Jesus, for example. Nobody has had more faith than Jesus. No one has even approached the kind of faith that Jesus had. But what did his faith in God lead to? It led to the worst kind of suffering imaginable. But then what was the reward of his faith? Well, as the Bible says, God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see, at the end of the day, the only way to live is to live by faith. Yes, it may get you into trouble. Yes, it may cause you to suffer a little bit. But at the end of the day, when God is glorified through your life, God's going to make sure that he doesn't just experience that glory on his own, but he's going to be glorified and bring you up with him so that your faith can experience the reward of eternal life with him in his eternal kingdom.